Hey guys and welcome to another video. Today we're testing another thin client. This one is interesting. It comes from Germany. It is the Eagle M330C. The brand Eagle means hedgehog in German. And yeah, lots of stuff to talk about in this video. We will take a look at all the ports, cover the specifications. We will open up the unit and have a look inside. We will then upgrade RAM and storage. And then we will test various operating systems. Today we're looking at Windows 10, Windows XP, Linux and MS-DOS. The machine came with a VIA Eden X2 U4200 dual core processor running at one gigahertz. We have two gigabytes of RAM and eight gigabytes of storage. I paid a little bit more than I wanted. I paid 30 US dollars. Now this has to do with the brand, a model from HP or Dell Wise. They are usually a little bit cheaper with similar specifications. Unfortunately, mine did not come with the stand. So when shopping around, make sure you read the description carefully and that it comes with a power supply and a stand. At the front of the machine, here's a power button. This is a touch sensor actually, and it will light up when the machine is working. This is a card reader slot, but I believe it's not connected, but we will have a look inside. And here you press and you get a USB 2 port as well as microphone and headphone port. At the back of the machine, here goes the power supply, two DVI ports. This one carries analog and I used an adapter to configure a CRT monitor, two USB 3 ports, another USB 2 port, gigabit ethernet and here we have a PS2 port. This is the bottom of the machine where you attach the stand which was missing with my machine. Here is some sort of an interface which I wasn't able to do much with. And here's a screw which we will loosen to get entry into the machine. So we just have to loosen this single screw. And the next step with a little bit of force is pulling off this piece of plastic. And then all we have to do is grab the top and slide it towards the back and we can lift it away. And here we are inside the machine. Let's have a look. So here we have the storage. So this is just a regular SATA uh, flash storage. It's not secured with a screw, which is interesting. So quite loose and this one is eight gigabytes. And yeah, you can install uh, a similar one with a larger capacity or you can use uh, one of these. This is an extension cable. This just gives you the opportunity to route the cable inside and then put your storage device somewhere else. We have a single DDR3 memory slot and I did upgrade the machine. So this one is two gigabytes of DDR3L and I have a eight gigabyte memory module here, also DDR3L, and that worked perfectly. So it looks like you can upgrade this machine to eight gigabytes of RAM. And there's another slot here. I believe this one is mini PCI Express. There's a jumper here to clear the BIOS and I've removed the CMOS battery as well. We have passive cooling, there's no active fan. In terms of power consumption, sitting idle on the desktop, I saw nine watts on my power meter and running something CPU intense, 17 watts. We have a VIA VX900 chipset with a VT8237A south bridge. The audio chip is from VIA with 192 kilohertz and 24 bit. VIA Chrome 9 HD integrated graphics. We have Realtek gigabit ethernet. The uh, USB is provided by VIA as well. And the USB 3 ports are provided by AS Media. And now let's try out some software. Windows 10 is first, the 64-bit version. We have eight gig of RAM and a one terabyte SSD. Windows installed just fine, but the updates took forever. The CPU is sitting at 100% at one gigahertz and with two cores, you have to be really patient. And out of the box, it does find most of the drivers, but the video card, uh, the driver is limited to 1280 by 1024. I then used the Snappy Driver Installer Origin and that installed a video driver. And now we can increase the resolution to 1920 by 1080p. Let's run the CPU set benchmark 117 for two cores and 59 for a single core. 
Here we have the performance of the SATA SSD. We can see the SATA interface is quite slow. It's not even SATA 2, it seems. It's somewhere between uh, SATA and SATA 2, which is quite odd. I tested the Ethernet port, copying games from the NAS, and we're getting the typical 100 megabytes per second, which is what you're getting for a gigabit Ethernet connection. And now I wanted to try some games, so I fired up Quake 3 at 1024 by 768 with the highest details. Unfortunately, we're getting only 20.1 FPS. So I tried uh, lowering the details. Here we have 640 by 480 with the fastest graphics preset, 29.2 FPS. So that is really disappointing. Uh, Quake 3 is a game that flies on a Pentium 3 or Pentium 4. And yeah, this machine is slower than that. Next, we will try Windows XP, which could be a quite suitable operating system for this machine. I downsized the RAM to two gigabytes and we're using a mechanical hard drive with 250 gigabytes. And usually I use the easy to boot project to install Windows XP off a USB flash drive, but it just didn't work for me. At a certain point in the installation process, the machine just hangs. Now, when working with thin clients, you might be interested in picking up a few accessories, for example, a USB floppy drive, a USB optical drive, and this interesting USB adapter, which lets you connect SATA 2.5 inch IDE and 3.5 inch IDE hard drives and plug them through USB to your modern desktop. So I tried the USB optical drive and we're booting off a Windows XP installation disk that worked fine. Unfortunately, later it blue screens because it can't find the hard drive. It has to do with the SATA controller. So the next step is to boot again from the USB optical drive, but also use the USB floppy drive, press F6 at the beginning of the installation, and this lets you load a SATA driver. And I tried a few uh, AHCI SATA drivers from the VIA website. Unfortunately, I lucked out. And yeah, this is the end of us working with Windows XP. I failed. I was not able to install Windows XP on this machine, which is a huge let down. So I had a go at trying Linux and please be aware I'm not an expert and I asked for help in our retro PC gaming Facebook group and there are a couple of people there that really know uh, what to do and they gave me a hand. So we're using Yabuntu 64 bit and yeah, you have to open the terminal and then install open Chrome drivers and then we get full 1080p and 3D graphics acceleration as well. Then I had a crack at downloading some GOG games. Um, I was a little bit disappointed by the user experience. We still have to muck around with the uh, terminal to yeah, basically install the game. And yeah, here we have running Blakestone Planet Strike through DOSBox, but look at that. The performance is really bad and even worse, we didn't get any audio. Um, that's quite odd. I was able to just play some media files and the sound was working just fine, but DOSBox didn't work. Now, uh, I know this is also just a little setting somewhere, but again, it's another uh, thing that you have to fix yourself. On the Retro PC Gaming Facebook group, I was also asked to try out DOSBox Distro and DOS Buntu. Those are ready to go Linux distributions that boot directly into DOSBox and things are ready to go. So DOSBox distro is first and it comes with an interesting menu with a couple of shareware games that you can try out and lots of other tools, but unfortunately no sound uh, again. And it did struggle with Duke Nukem 3D, but I believe it does run at a higher resolution. Next, I tried DOS Buntu, and here, yeah, there are some audio options actually to try different devices, but still, I couldn't get any sound going. And now we're checking out MS-DOS. We have a 32 gigabyte SSD and two gigs of RAM. I'm using Rufus to write a MS-DOS 6.22 floppy image onto a USB flash drive. We boot from that, partition the storage device, format it, make it bootable, and then I shut the machine down, put the SSD into the USB adapter, and copy games, benchmarks, drivers, and everything across. The machine has a PC beeper installed, and it works in DOS games, 
but unlike with HP machines, the sound does not get routed through the headphone port. The USB mouse and USB keyboards are working under DOS. In the game Gods, we get the familiar scrolling bug, uh, which affects all these machines with via chipset and via graphics solution. And yeah, the DVI to VGA adapter. Uh, if you install that, you can drive a retro CRT monitor. Let's try some DOS benchmarks at 320 by 200. 357 for 3D Bench 1.0C, 360 FPS for PC Player Benchmark, and 275 FPS for Quake. That is pretty decent performance, so DOS games at 320 by 200 will run perfectly fine. At 640 by 480, we're getting 114 FPS for Chris's 3D Benchmark. 64 FPS for the PC player benchmark and Quake runs at 17 FPS. So at 640 by 480, some games might work okay, but Quake, for example, the CPU is not powerful enough. Things get interesting when we're trying to slow down the machine. Firstly, I used set mal to disable the CPU cache and look at that, 11.4 in 3D Bench 1.0. That is the performance. It's roughly on the level on a 386DX running at around 25 megahertz. Now there has to be something where this machine is good at and I struck gold when I was trying to slow it down further. We're testing a utility that we haven't used before it goes under the name of CPU Speed Utility, and this is a hardware slowdown utility using ACPI and features of the Southbridge. And we are lucky the via Southbridge in this machine is supported, and we're getting uh, 16 fine speed settings from 1 to 16. And yeah, let's have a look at some benchmark results. So first we're using the 16 speed settings with the CPU cache enabled and yeah, we can see a really nice and smooth slowdown, but it gets really interesting when we deactivate the CPU cache and look at that. It's such a slow machine and slow is good for old games. The absolute slowest setting with T set to one is 1.2 FPS in 3D Bench 1.0, and that is the slowest result I've ever seen. So what is this good for? Here I'm playing Sopwith. This is a game that is speed sensitive. It is unplayable on most newer, even retro PCs, but on this machine, slowed down to the lowest setting, it is playable, and it is so playable that I was actually able to, for the first time in my life, finish this game. So guys, what is the conclusion of this thin client? Let's start with Windows 10. It runs it, the 64-bit version. You can upgrade the machine to 8 gigs of RAM and a big SSD. Performance is very limited, but it will run Windows 10, so that is pretty impressive. And it is sort of usable. Uh, it's not a great experience, but it will run software. Windows XP was a huge letdown. I had high hopes. On HP machines, we didn't have the issue with the via SATA controller because they usually have a uh, IDE interface, but on this machine, we didn't have such luck. And unfortunately, I was not able to figure it out. All the usual methods that I tried didn't work and loading the SATA driver through the floppy F6 method, I also didn't have any luck. With Linux, I don't have too much experience. Thanks to the help of other people, I was able to install a few uh, operating systems and have a go. I wasn't too impressed, the performance was lackluster, sound wasn't working, and you have to use the terminal quite a bit. Um, personally, I thought it's a lot more similar to Windows, to be honest. Uh, people might hate me for saying this, but yeah, I didn't have much luck with, with Linux on, on this machine. Now, MS-DOS worked pretty well on this machine. The issue is MS-DOS runs on pretty much anything client and there are better options out there. Some even have PCI slots. Most of them route the PC speaker through the headphone port. If you're getting a thin client with a Radeon graphics, then you don't have the scrolling issue in gods. So again, a very mixed experience. The slowdown function is pretty cool. Having said that, this is also something that will very likely work on thin clients from HP or Dell Wise that have the same wire Southbridge. 
So unfortunately, guys, this is one I cannot recommend. Too many issues, too many things didn't work and you can get a model from HP with similar specifications, likely for a lower price and with more stock available. But if you're from Germany and I have quite a few German viewers and you're familiar with this uh, manufacturer, maybe there are other machines worth checking out. Here in Australia, this brand is really quite rare. Um, so that's why I was curious and wanted to have one. But now I'm not so sure if I should get any more. But if you do have a model that is worth checking out, leave a comment down below in the comment section. And yeah, we are at the end of the video. Give it a like, share the video with your friends. Let me know what you want to see next and what projects interest you. And yeah, that's it. I hope you liked it. I shall see you soon with another one.